When he first arrived in Doha, Dick Tucker was walking along the Corniche looking for the Museum of Islamic Art. He saw two fellas fishing and decided to ask them for directions. When they met his request in English with blank looks, he repeated the same question in Arabic. Still getting no response, but remembering that Doha is a cosmopolitan city, he asked in French, followed by Spanish, then German. Still holding their attention, but getting no answer, he tried the question in Russian, Japanese, and finally Chinese. Having exhausted his supply of modern languages, he gave up and continued down the Corniche, hoping he was headed in the right direction. After he left, the first fellow said to the second, you know, I would like to learn a second language. And the other replied, why? That fellow knew eight, and didn't, they didn't do him any good. <laughs> I first heard that joke, much better told, I, I should add, uh, by Dick Tucker 10 years ago at Carnegie Mellon's Women's Society's luncheon. Since my association with Dick Tucker goes back 15 years, rather than offering a list of what he has done during the last year, I've been charged with revealing some things to you about Dick that you may not have had time to learn during his short time on this campus. In preparing my comments, I consulted some mutual friends on the main campus and will mix their voices with mine in providing you a clearer picture of Dick. That's right, I had help with my homework. Don't tell the dean. Including this time, I will be making three appearances. Each time I will share with you two of the C's. The first one is communication. With Dick, you have incredible empathy mixed in with formidable intelligence. I sometimes think wistfully, perhaps I too could show signs of Dick's empathy if I had anything close to that incredible memory of his. Dick remembers every detail worth remembering, and he remembers it fluently. His voice is so sweet and his eyes so generous and kind as he talks to you that you can easily forget he is briefing you with a mountain of essential information in a few short sentences. I now pro invite Professor Amal Amalki to come to the podium. Dick Tucker, for some of you, is the professor, the head, the dean, and maybe the only dean that you know. Um, for some, he has been the boss for the past year, and for others, he has been a colleague from back home. And for many linguists around the world, he's a household name, an expert that they're dying to know and meet. I've never worked with Dick directly. He has never been my boss or the head of my department. And he was the dean while I was on a leave. But he has been playing a major role in my life. Dick has been one of the first people who were so invested in opening a campus here in Qatar. I know through a common friend that he was supposed to play a major role back in 2004, but his health stood in the way. Dick was supposed to serve all the functions that David Koffer, the, head, the former head of English department, did. Uh, but Dick had back surgery, and his travels were greatly limited. David tells me that filling in for Dick was the hardest thing ever. Um, and when making decisions and hiring people for here for this campus, he always asked himself if Dick would be happy with his choices. This is exactly what happened when Chet Thorpe called David um, Koffer and told him we have a Qatari faculty, a uh, Qatari with a PhD who wants to teach for us and wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, not so convinced back then, David asked to meet me over video conference and then he offered me to come to Pittsburgh but with no guarantees. David says that he channeled Dick in making such offer, knowing that Dick has been a lifetime student of this region and had no skepticism whatsoever in, in our campus here. Dick knew about my trip to Pittsburgh, but I don't remember seeing him on my first week in Baker Hall. Uh, David has been so confused to what to do with me, and he was so busy being ahead. So he uh, had me sit on Shakespeare classes. Um, I met Dick a week later, and Dick doesn't know this, but I was back then almost ready to give up uh, and fly back to London and accept an offer there. I've been struggling on different levels. I had moved from a flat to a five-bedrooms be five house. I found a mouse in the house. Um, I witnessed my first snowstorm, and I locked myself in the house with no food except crisps. And I had to sit on Shakespeare classes. But thank God I met Dick. Some people don't really need to say anything to comfort you. Just being in their presence and engulfed with their goodness is just enough. 
That, that was the case of our first meeting, but we did talk. Dick told me about his first visit to Doha in the early 80s, um, his work in Egypt in Iftahia Simpson, Open Sesame. We didn't talk business, but I felt that I was given a huge push. And this is when I told David, I won't teach Shakespeare, and instead I'll develop my own course and I'll sit on his class that resulted with the writer's craft. Dick's support continued, the kind of support that doesn't come in encouraging formulas, but instead in the push feeling you feel inside of you. This is Dick, the mentor. Dick is the kind of mentor that teaches you by example, and he is the best example anyone could have. Even during this year when I was on a leave, he was always there supporting me and making me feel like he has always been as a part of this big family. Dick has a genuine sympathy towards other people and other cultures. Just like an anthropologist, he is someone who wouldn't judge, who would accept you, accept your, the differences, and respect you. So I'll just end up with one sentence that both an English and an Arabic speaker would get. You have a heart of gold. And now, students and colleagues, I introduce you to Dick Tucker. Thank you, Amal. A journey like this is scripted, or is planned, or is deliberate. One is in high school, and one decides, I'm going to study X in high school. I'll go to college Y. I will major in Z. I'll go out into the world to do W. Sometimes it's very scripted. It's very known. Sometimes one's parents write the script but it is still followed. My life wasn't like that. It was just, my career just sort of happened. I had a transformative experience when I was at Williams College. My dad had plans. My dad wanted me to go to college. He liked Williams College because he was from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and that's the next town over to Williamstown. He thought I would go to college, I would major in economics, I'd go to law school, and then I'd be a lawyer. And in fact, in my first semester and my second semester, I took economics. I won't say this too loudly because we have business faculty sitting in the audience, but that just wasn't me. I didn't resonate with economics. In the second year, my roommate was from Hong Kong, Mai Shang. I took an exciting experimental psychology course, a really exciting course, where I worked as a research assistant, an undergraduate research assistant. In the third year, I worked as a research assistant for a psychology professor, worked for him over the summer on an NSF grant, and in fact co-authored a paper with him that was published in Science. Some of you perhaps know the uh, uh, journal magazine uh, Science. Fourth year, I participated in a program that Williams had called Williams in Hong Kong, and I taught English at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And there, I really became curious about the process of second language learning, of bilingualism, how people keep languages straight inside their head, what they do with it, how they feel when they meet other people, different cultures, different um, people, different genders, different cultures, different nationalities, different languages, and so on. The truth is, I went to graduate school in Canada because I could play intercollegiate football for three more years. I was accepted at Yale, I was accepted at the University of Virginia, University of Michigan, Harvard, and Williams, uh, and, and McGill, um, but Canada has different intercollegiate eligibility. And that was really, really attractive. So I could go and I could participate in a psychology program and I could play football for three more years. But I could also learn more about social and psychological factors in second language learning and bilingualism. The McGill program, uh, as in many programs in Canada, are a combination of the American model and the British model. There is some coursework structured but it's much more research intensive, research oriented. So in fact, from the time you register as a student with a BA in your first semester 
until you complete your dissertation, there were only three one semester required courses that you had to take. You could, of course, take more. There were many exciting courses and options and so on, but the expectation is that one is involved in research, that one is doing research, uh, that one is learning how to ameliorate and to solve real world problems. So it was a problem-based orientation, although it was couched within the context of theoretical grounding, but you had to work pretty hard to get that. Well, you all are all too young to remember, but the 1960s in Quebec, to a little extent now, but not nearly so much, the um, 1960s was characterized by what was referred to oftentimes at the time as the two solitudes. There was the Francophone or the French-speaking population, there was the Anglophone or the English-speaking population, and although there were some points and periods of interaction, you could really be quite separate. You could, in fact, pretty much live your life and interact, for example, exclusively in English, and the only contact with French would be a telephone would ring, you'd pick it up, and it would be the wrong number, somebody speaking French. They obviously wouldn't want to talk to you because you didn't speak French. There were likewise two separate school systems. There was the Pro Protestant school system of Greater Montreal, which was predominantly English-speaking or Anglophone, and there was the um, uh, Catholic School Commission of Montreal, which was predominantly French-speaking, and the two didn't really interact, and they didn't really do a very good job of teaching the other language in their school systems. So there was a minimal attempt to teach French in the English system and vice versa, but it wasn't really very effective. Well, I was involved with a professor at the time by the name of Wallace Lambert, who went on to uh, become my dissertation advisor and with whom I later went on to write three books and uh, have a very um, a productive um, relationship with. And he became involved in a community, right, um, in the suburbs of Montreal, where the parents had decided that they really wanted their children to have access to essentially a bilingual education. So we worked with this school system in St. Lambert, for those of you who know the community, right across the St. Lawrence River, and we started out by identifying groups of parents who wished to participate, wished to put their children into what became an experimental, with a small e in quotation marks, program where they would go to school. Kindergarten grade one would be essentially almost completely in French. By grade two, English literacy would be introduced. By grade three, grade four, a little bit more English. By the time you got to grade five, grade six, some content taught in French, some content taught in English, going on through the secondary school level. We only started thinking it would be one year at a time. Likewise, we put great pain into trying to establish representative control groups that were similar. English parents, however, in the same system who had chosen to send their children to English schools. French children in the same community who were going to the French school. Similar socioeconomic status, similar education level of the parents, and so on. And we ultimately ended up following a pilot class and then a follow-up class. And what was interesting is that we conducted what became a 12-year longitudinal study to look at the cumulative benefits of participating over the period from kindergarten through the transition to college. At that time, high school in uh, the province of Quebec uh, terminated in grade 11. So there were only kindergarten plus 11 years of formal schooling before transition to, to college or university. So we followed a pilot class and we followed um, a follow-up class and their control comparisons for 12 years. Uh, and we found that students learned math as well as their control counterparts. That is, if you looked at the children educated bilingually and you assessed their math in English or you assessed their math in French, they compared favorably with their control counterparts. Students developed appropriate English language skills, which was what parents were worried about. If I put my child into this system, will they not learn English? Will they somehow be behind? They learned English language skills. They developed French skills. They're receptive, I have to note, were better than productive, but they developed um, skills that they could use in the workforce or in higher education. And very interesting to us, these were students, remember, who didn't grow up bilingual, but they were Anglophone, and they had made a choice, their parents had made a choice for them to go into this bilingual program. So students who were caused or who were assisted to become bilingual 
developed significantly greater creativity and cognitive flexibility than their controlled counterparts. On average, some of you uh, who do research of this type using a measure like the Raven progressive matrices or something like that, on average, um, at least a standard deviation above uh, their counterparts, a significant, uh, significant difference. I was at a conference. I met a fellow by the name of Clifford Prater at a bar in Washington. I was there for a conference. I was finishing up my PhD. I was down and I was chatting with this person. And I said, well, you know, we introduced ourselves and what we're doing and so on and so forth. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, he said, I'm having conversations with some people because we're trying to find someone who would be willing to go to the Philippines to work as a language education program advisor for the Ford Foundation. I said, well, that's interesting. Um, I'm staying up on the sixth floor. My suitcase is packed. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go to the Philippines. And uh, he said, no, no, you don't understand. We're looking for someone who is interested in, willing to, ready to explore opportunities to go to the Philippines. I said, no, no, you don't understand. Um, we're ready uh, to go to the Philippines. To make a, uh, to make a long story short, um, what was it? I don't know, Ray, maybe eight weeks later, we were on a plane flying to Los Angeles uh, for briefings and then uh, off on our way uh, to the Philippines. So we spent time in the Philippines uh, with the uh, Ford Foundation. We were there for two years. We had a wonderful experience. Um, our first daughter was born in the Philippines. Uh, we had an opportunity to conduct and put in place a national language survey of the Philippines, which literally took us to every province in the Philippines, uh, collecting information that then informed the evolution of the bilingual education language policy in the Philippines. Um, and then I went back and joined the faculty at McGill. Um, and again, probably an unknown fact, trivia. Uh, I had perhaps the only triple appointment in North America where I had an appointment as a faculty member in the Department of uh, Psychology, Linguistics, and Athletics. Because in addition to being a professor of psychology and linguistics, I was also the offensive line coach of the university football team. And that was the same as it had been for the past 78 years. So what did that mean? That meant when the children got to grade 11 and got to grade 12, and the emphasis was on rote memorization and translation, the children and the teachers couldn't afford to focus on the new communicatively oriented, communicatively based curricula because the stakes were too high. If they didn't prepare the children for the Taujihi examination or the Thanawe Ama, the teacher would be held to blame. The teacher would fail. So of course in grade 11 and grade 12 they couldn't do what we were preparing them to do, but they had to move back and do what they had been doing for the past 78 years. Um, so we learned the importance of ensuring that all the pieces are in synchrony, if you will. If you're introducing changes in curriculum, if you're introducing changes in teacher training, if you're introducing changes in materials, you have to ensure that you introduce the appropriate either changes or to put into place the appropriate practices with respect to evaluation of progress, with respect to your expectations for benchmarks and so on. And the other exciting thing that we did during those days was to launch, as uh, Amal kindly referred to, uh, Ifthaya Sim Sim. Uh, this was a very, very exciting um, opportunity. The Ford Foundation worked collaboratively with the uh, Gulf States uh, Co-Production Television Authority. And the part that I became uh, interested in is that the initial question was, do we need to develop four different versions of Ifthaya Sim Sim, one for the Maghreb, one for the Levant, one for Egypt, and one for the Gulf? Or can we, in fact, develop one soundtrack and use it across the whole um, Arab world? Um, complicated uh, set of questions, much more complicated than we have time for today. But the, um, the, 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 the answer was we did research with three, four, five, six, seven, and eight-year-old children in each of the various regions. And the answer was that the visual, the music, the plot, the characters was so powerful that it engaged the children and drew them in, and they learned MSA despite themselves. Um, so it was a net win, we think. Um, the international pathway that followed, well, as I said, I worked for the Ford Foundation in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, North Africa for five years. Then I moved to Washington as president of a nonprofit organization, the Center for Applied Linguistics, sometimes known as CAL. We opened offices in Bangkok, Manila, Melbourne, Florida, and uh, San Francisco, California, because those were the times 
They were the ending, virtual ending of the um, conflict in Vietnam. Many, many Vietnamese refugees were candidates for resettlement in the United States in relatively large numbers. Um, we were concerned with refugee resettlement, cultural orientation, and effective second language learning for them. What's the life of a president of a 100% soft money nonprofit organization like? Well, from my perspective, the main task of the head of a nonprofit is to help to cause, to incite people to do more than they're capable or than they think they're capable of doing. You're not going to reward them with pay. You're not going to reward them with time off. They're going to have to work pretty darn hard because 100% soft money organizations are ones where you're really scrambling because you've got to raise the funding to do the work to keep the people that you need employed and so on and so forth. We grew the center from a staff of about 35 to a staff of about 125. Uh, we opened offices in various places um, and, and did some good things. But at some point, you come to the realization that the best guess of what you'll do tomorrow is what you did yesterday. And when you come to that realization, you know it's time to move on. The role of serendipity. I was flying to Manila. I went out to Southeast Asia about six times a year for the 10 years uh, that we had the offices when I was there. And I was flying to Manila to visit the Cal office there. And I overnighted in San Francisco to have breakfast with someone, um, the majority of you will not know the name, but Charles Ferguson was a former, the, the, the um, a pioneer, the initial director of the Center for Applied Linguistics. Uh, and he was also um, a, a specialist in second language learning, sociolinguistics, Arabic language instruction, and so on. And he told me, they're doing some interesting things at Carnegie Mellon. You might want to check it out. So I did. I checked it out. And in fact, at that point, um, the, um, the, um, there were some interesting things going on. Robert Morabian had become president. Uh, he was expanding, um, thinking about internationalization. He was... Um, encouraging the modern language department to think about expansion and so on. And um, so I met with President Morabian, and the selling point, the reason I went to Carnegie Mellon, is he promised me that I could be a real professor and never, ever have to take on any administrative responsibilities. I was sold. That was wonderful. That's all I needed. So when I got there, um, some things had happened in the 40s and 50s, and I honestly don't know all the history, but Modern Languages was not an independent or an autonomous, autonomous department. It was a ward of the history department. Uh, it was a program within the history department with a small number, very small number of faculty that taught French, German, and Spanish. Um, I spent 12 plus years as department head there. I like to think that we built a world-class department of Modern Languages. We moved from being a ward of the history department to an autonomous department, which now has almost 30 full-time faculty. We moved from teaching French, Spanish, and German to teaching now eight languages. We offer, in fact, the largest undergraduate Chinese program east of the Rocky Mountains now. We established a doctoral program in applied linguistics. We have a graduate who's sitting here with us in the second row, Sylvia Pessoa, of whom we're very, very proud. Um, so they were good days. I like to think as well, going back to some remarks that Amal made, that when I stepped down as head, we had a unit committed to being the best that we could be in our teaching, our research, and our community service, but while still supporting attention to the primacy of one's family. The offer, would you, i.e. me, consider being interim dean of student affairs? This is someone who's a department head a university, a research professor. Would I become Dean of Student Affairs? <clears throat> well, I called our two daughters to get their thoughts. Both of them were college graduates. <sighs> Lara, who is the older, thought she remembered that maybe there was something like a Dean of Student Affairs when she was in college, but she couldn't remember who it was or what the person did. Debbie, who was our younger daughter, in fact, did know that there had been a Dean of Student Affairs, and she even thought she remembered his name, but didn't think she had any contact with him or anything. So, I said, oh, well. Yeah. So then I got a telephone call from Jerry Cullen. He said, I know you've had um, 
some conversations with Bill Elliott and with um, Michael, uh, Michael Murphy, and I don't in any way want to influence the decision, but I would be ever so grateful if you would consider accepting the offer to become interim dean of <clears throat> student affairs. Well, to make a complicated story very brief, um, I started uh, that summer uh, and spent a year as interim dean of student affairs. Now, I've got to tell you, in hindsight, as a department head, I knew a bit about the Division of Student Affairs. I had interacted with people. I knew about their college liaison model. I uh, knew what they did in terms of uh, uh, their work in orientation. I knew about the work that they did in residence life. I knew about the work that the various uh, student activities, student life, and so on. But I had no idea what unbelievable dedication and what unbelievable commitment these people put in 24-7. Unbelievable. They are there on behalf of our students all the time. And as an academic, even one who is in tune, even one who knows what's going on, you just can't begin to imagine until you experience it firsthand. The support they provide, the tutoring they provide, the scaffolding they provide, the assistance in going to the hospital when someone is sick, the brokering that they do on someone when someone has some trouble uh, in terms of a lease or something, that 24-7 they are always there. And I'll tell you, we are very fortunate because right here on this campus with our student affairs staff, with Gloria Hurry and with uh, the folks that work with her, we have exactly the same type of commitment uh, of individuals who take as their charge the total development, the total education of the whole individual. The early days of CMUQ, um, this is just a little bit out of sync, but this goes back a little bit more. The early days, the conversations uh, began 2002, continued to 2003, we, uh, we started up in 2004. Um, at the time, I was on the um, Educational Testing Service, TOEFL Policy Council, Test of English as a Foreign Language, and so I had access to lots of data coming in and so on and so forth. And um, there was a, a, a little bit of a discussion on the coconut radio that we were having some conversations with folks in Qatar about the possibility of becoming a part of Education City. And I did some quick research. And um, then there was a presentation by President Cohen and by uh, Provost Camlet at a department heads meeting. And they laid out a plan. And I remember raising my hand and I said, gee, no, um, are, are you aware that um, uh, of the 22 um, Arabic speaking countries which um, collect TOEFL data, um, the uh, <clears throat> rank, rank uh, average rank uh, um, from Qatar is uh, at the bottom of the, of, of the list. And he looked at me and said, you're making that up. And, and, and I said, no, no, actually, I'm, I, I'm not. Th those are the data. Um, what's the good news coming out of that? The good news coming out of that is that it caused us, once we entered into a commitment, to take seriously the need to develop a new approach to the teaching of 76-100, 76-101, so with the um, assistance of uh, people such as Sylvia and people such as Dudley and others who were here at the time and then have continued here, um, we put in place programs here in Doha which have had a significant positive backwash to Pittsburgh. And so our program at Pittsburgh is different now because, as you know, we have um, anywhere in any given year from 15 to 20 percent of the students on the Pittsburgh campus at the undergraduate level are English um, language learners. Um, so I had the opportunity as well to participate in the so-called Original Cutter Curriculum Committee with John, Chuck, Milton, Indira, and others. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, Sylvia assisted us, uh, although she was a, a doctoral student at Pittsburgh in the time, coming out and doing the screening that led to the um, placement of the first two classes of students and so on. The other thing that I did which was interesting, and this was back in 2006-2007, People on the main campus continued to ask the question, are the students real? Is the program there like the program here? What about the students that you admit? What about the um, admissibility of candidates? And so I was asked to do something that faculty members generally are not asked to do. Um, some may have been, some may be, but on, on our campus um, uh, it's, it's not common. I was asked to come out and to participate as a, as a part of the admissions team to sit down and to read folders and to go through and say, we'll take this one, we'll not take that one, we'll take this one, we'll put this one on the wait list. And so I participated in two different years in the admissions process with then Brian Zerbe um, and his team. Um, and I had a sense, I could go through and I could look and I could see how the students were doing in terms of achievement measured by test scores, 
how the students were doing in terms of what we at, Pitts, uh, what we at Carnegie Mellon refer to as the L factor, the leadership factor. Um, were they the president of the chess club? Were they the head of the debating society? Were they involved in football? Were they involved in cricket, Jeff? Uh, and so on. And um, I came back and I, and I could look also in the statements they had written and in the recommendations that were written on their behalf as to their community service, as to their outreach into the community, and so on. And so I came away saying, these students are real. These students are admissible. These students are ones we want to take. They are leaders in their community. They are engaged in service learning as appropriate in their community or their region. So um, again, I had responsibility in the early days for pre presenting reports at a number of board of trustees meetings and so on, trying to stress the idea that CMUQ uh, is us, which I believe. So what are the reflections on the year now ending? The reflections are a few. One, enormous dedication by all of you, whether you are staff, whether you are faculty, whether you are graduate teaching assistants, whoever you are. Enormous dedication to our mission, to our students and to your colleagues. The realization that we can and that we will contribute significantly to the impl implementation of the Qatar National Vision 2030. We have been intentionally this year trying to align our work so that we can support and contribute to the realization of QNV 2030 through participation and discussion of the National Development Strategy and in other activities. There's also, thirdly, an awareness that the time is right to begin to map what we refer to or what our external program reviewers referred to as our research with a capital R ecosystem. What are our plans over the next several years? Where do we see our research agenda taking us? How does it intersect with the needs of Qatar society and the Gulf region in general? Like you, there are occasional frustrations tempered by knowing that we're all following unmapped paths. Sometimes double meetings, or meetings get double booked or double scheduled. Sometimes it takes longer to push a purchase order through than you wish it did. Sometimes uh, you'd like to make an appointment uh, or to, to, to appoint someone to a position tomorrow, but it seems to take six weeks to do it. We're learning the procedures. We're learning um, some of these frustrations are not unique to this campus. You should be on the Pittsburgh campus. Um, we have them too. Um, and the administration uh, established a committee to deal with these uh, frustrations, and it had an acronym, uh, and it had four letters that represented the four words um, that were part of the charge of the committee, and it was called the BARF Committee, which quickly became known as the BARF Committee, and you can imagine <clears throat> how that was viewed in terms of the subject matter it was dealing with and so on. But the reflections are that nevertheless, we know we're all in this together. Sincere thanks to each of the senior staff in operations, in facilities, media, uh, marketing and public relations, global security, IT, student affairs, planning and institutional effectiveness, finance, admissions, academic affairs, human resources, research, thanks to each of you, to the senior staff, and to all of their assistants. Sincere thanks to each of the area coordinators, to Kamal, to Selma, to Sham, to Terry, and sincere thanks to Bob and to Richard. But most of all, thanks to Sean Sadler. I couldn't have done it without her. So my own idiosyncratic pathway in retrospect. I had a wonderful mentor at Williams College who involved me in his research and who piqued my curiosity. I had a wonderful mentor and problem-oriented doctoral program at McGill that prepared me to ask and to answer real-world real world questions. 
I had a serendipitous chance to work as a program advisor in language education in Southeast Asia with the Ford Foundation at the age of 25. In fact, it was very interesting, back in those days, the Ford Foundation flew you first class, and Ray and I were flying the last leg, flying to Manila, and we noticed the plane sort of taxied in, and we noticed that there were people coming up to the side of the plane to the jetway, and they looked like they were waiting for someone to get off. And I turned to Ray and I said, Ray, I wonder, who, who, I wonder who's sitting up here with us. I wonder who they're waiting for. And we got out and for crying out loud, there was a minister of education and there was the president of the National Teacher Training College. They were waiting for us. <laughs> and we couldn't believe it. 25 years old and all these people are waiting for us. Um, serendipity. I had the opportunity to serve as president of a 100% soft money nonprofit organization for 13 years. And that really helped me to learn how it is to work effectively with people, to cause them, to help them, to encourage them to do more than they think they're capable of doing. I had an environment at Carnegie Mellon that fosters and encourages intellectual and entrepreneurial curiosity over and over again. We are so fortunate to have Jared Cohen as our president, as indeed we were before that with Presidents Syert and President Morabian, who were the ones that I knew. I have a wonderful wife, Ray, who has chosen to follow the same pathway with me for 46 plus years. Not all that frequent these days. So if I were to make an observation, I would say that Ray and I feel truly blessed at this time in our lives and in our careers to have had this opportunity to contribute directly in this way to Carnegie Mellon in general and to Carnegie Mellon Qatar in particular. And that we've had the opportunity to return to live in an Arab world now so different from that which we had come to know and to love during the 1970s. So what's the pathway from Qatar? I think of Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry we could not travel both. We shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and we, we took the ones less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you very much. And well, now that Dick has, Dick has had his chance to tell you about his path to get her to cut her, my role has changed. I'm no longer telling you things you didn't know about Dick Tucker. I'm telling you the other side of the story. Uh, to, brief, to brief various interested groups. Dick Tucker did this, these briefings, and by coincidence, I was a common element between all the groups. I declined. While I knew the information by that time, I was not connected to it the way Dick was, nor as connected to the international population he represented or the interested groups he was addressing. He was connected because what seems to run deepest in Dick, what makes him tick, in my view, is his profound sense of selfless service to his profession, to the world, to his family, to his colleagues, and not least, to Carnegie Mellon. If good things have come to Dick throughout his life, it is because he loves the work and thinks nothing of the reward. The fact that Dick would spend a year with us as interim dean speaks volumes about his sense of service. I can assure you, he had other important things to do this past academic year, but you will never hear that from him. If you think you will miss Dick in the job, I can assure you you will. Dick is sorely missed in every job he has ever left. The only upside of Dick leaving a job are the new populations who benefit from going to work with Dick in whatever new job he takes on. Did you, well, you do know now that uh, the year after Dick became a university professor, he agreed to step in as the interim dean of students. The Dean of Students handles student welfare issues of all kinds. It's a thankless, full-time job, and Dick took it on gracefully and successfully for one year. The Dean of Student Affairs has typically been a staff job, not a faculty job. To my knowledge, no Dean of Students Affairs has ever been a member of the faculty, much less a university professor. I'm sure the people who worked with Dick in Student Affairs didn't know or care about that. I'm sure Dick never told them. I just know they loved him in, in the job or, and would have been happy to let him do it forever. 
like all of us who have seen Dick perform at any job. Dick is very well, is very well qualified to make comparisons between ES, our ESL student body and other populations. Dick has a gift of always putting the emphasis on you, nor never on himself. If I were to ask you why Dick Tucker is not only a good guy, but also a university professor at CMU, I bet most of you would have no clue. I'm sure Dick has never told you. He'd be too busy focusing on you. Most people who attain the rank of university professor, CMU's highest academic honor, are scary in their level of accomplishment. They may be nice people, but I can assure you it's not a nice guy award. You only become a university professor because you have tackled the most challenging intellectual problems in your field and you've come out victorious. Dick has attained that rank and his accomplishments are indeed scary in the sense of scary impressive. Dick and his colleagues more or less invented the methods by which the long-term cognitive gains of bilingualism are now routinely studied. We may now take it for granted that bilinguals have advantages in their cognitive dexterity that monologue, mon monolinguals don't have. But if we take it for granted, it is because of Dick's pioneering work. Long before English was widely known as the global language, countries were trying to install English into their school systems. This may seem like an easy problem, but it's not. It's not like ordering English textbooks from Amazon and sprinkling them across the country. It involves doing countrywide surveys to assess why a country needs English, circulating the needs assessment back across the country for feedback and refinement, holding countrywide town meetings, and then shaping policy that addresses the needs. It is something like holding a cabinet post in a country and making skeptical constituents happy. It is very involved work that takes months of leadership work, organization, networking, and implementation. It is hard to make it work in one country, one's own country, much less a foreign country. Dick did it successfully not only in one country on one continent, but in three countries on three continents. Dick Tucker is a household name worldwide for his intellectual achievements. More people around the world may know his work than the work of any other single CMU professor. I'll bet you didn't know that. Dick will never care that you know it. He probably doesn't like the fact I mentioned it. But it's nice to know anyway, to understand what a unique human being he is. I now invite Cutter Campus scholar Samreen Anjum and student body president Mohammed Ibrahim Janahi to come to the podium. Good evening and welcome. My name is Samreen Anjum and I'm a senior computer science student. As we all gather today to celebrate the successful year of Dean Tucker's leadership, I would like to add some of my personal experiences and memorable moments with Dean Tucker. I remember last year, at about, at about this time, we were told that uh, we are getting a new dean. And um, like many other students, the same questions went through my mind. What will the transition will be? What will the transition be? What kind of new ideas and changes will the, dean, will the new dean bring in, et cetera? Today, at the end of this year, I'm sure you all will join me in saying that the transition has been completely seamless and much rather positive. Dean Tucker embraced our campus wholeheartedly and with full enthusiasm commenced his role as the interim dean of Carnegie Mellon Qatar. Under his leadership, we have seen this campus grow and, has, and witnessed his presence and support in several student gatherings. One of the most significant initiatives that is close to me personally is the Dean's Student Advisory Council. This is the first Dean's Student Advisory Council here in the Qatar campus and was initiated by Dean Tucker just a few months after his appointment. This gave us students a, a platform to bring our concerns and suggestions, be it big or small, from different majors and classes to his notice directly. Dean Tucker patiently listened to all our concerns and welcomed all his suggestions with a big smile and an open mind. As he listened to us, he put on what I call as a multi-personality hat and could easily switch between being a dean, a professor, a student, as well as a parent. He addressed all our issues with this hat on and led discussions in a very logical and positive manner. This approachable attitude assured us that our concerns are being heard. This assured us that we have a very caring hand upon us. In these meetings, we discussed several points related to the library, academic integrity, student-professor relationships, and the list goes on. One year and such a huge impact. Dean Tucker, you have been a wonderful caretaker 
and a great leader. And we have been very fortunate to have a glimpse, a short one, but a very strong glimpse of your leadership. You will be deeply missed and remembered, and we thank you for all your great contributions to our campus. We hope you come back to visit us soon, and we, and we wish you a blessed, prosperous, and a successful future ahead. Thank you. Yes, everything that needs to be said has been said, but uh, I'll try to provide a different perspective. So, ever since Professor Richard Tucker has been announced, has been announced the Dean of CMUQ, as Samreen said, I've also wondered of what changes will he make? What uh, changes will he bring? What's his vision? What kind of person is he? Uh, so, unfortunately, because he stayed with us for only one year, only some of those questions were answered. Most of the others were answered tonight. <laughs> One of the first things I noticed about Dean Tucker is that he's a professor of applied linguistics. Later on in Marhabat Tardens, I discovered that he is actively teaching courses in spite of the duties of being a dean. Our dean really is a hard worker. Another thing I noticed is that the dean is never in his office. Well, maybe he is, but uh, I always see him around campus, attending this event or giving a speech at that one. He attends a lot of events that are relevant, that are relevant to the students. Our dean is supportive. If only he attended the student majlis Thursday majlis in the food court at noon. One last thing. Very recently, I discovered that the dean is an advocate of sports, something that made me personally much more interested in knowing more about him. That is going to make me say our dean is great. But unfortunately, he's leaving us. He's leaving us. So with wishes that I could have known him better, and wishes that he doesn't have a great, but a greater future. I thank him dearly for his time with us. Thank you, Dean Tucker. This says is Dean Tucker, your leadership through times of growth and transition has been solid, graceful, and kind. Shukran, CMUQ, CMUQ faculty, April 20th, 2011. And, and in, the, and in the, the, uh, I guess it's a book box, in the book box are 12 books, one for each month that the Tuckers were with us. We have to recognize the assistance of our administrative assistants, Amira, Eleanor, and Masuna. They were great. They spent enough time to go to the soup, to talk to different people, to try to get something that represents the best of our soul for our dean and for Mrs. Tucker. So thank you everyone for having come and you are now invited, each one which will go to the reception. So thank you again. Happy summer to all. Dean Tucker, Ray Tucker, thank you very much. You are part of our life, our memory, and we thank you. Shukran, merci beaucoup. Thank you.